thing up. I have a few words first, so sit down. You know, it's one of these things, that's what you, we normally did in Rotary always. And I'm so glad that we all have this ability to, I mean, it's sort of like Pavlov, you know, we all sort of just do this automatically. Well, it's not necessary to, but it's always good to have some exercise. But before we get started with our uh, with our music, which we do, I want to tell you a little bit more about our future vision moment, uh, which we have, and that's thanks to uh, Jan and Kathy, uh, just telling you a little bit more about what all of the planning for our future at Seattle for. Um, and I will read this fairly fast. Seattle Rotary is more than Wednesday lunch meetings and community service projects. The future vision also prioritizes social connection and member engagement. And that's why you're invited to regular member gatherings where we can spend time together, get better acquainted, enjoy shared interests in service and fellowship and strengthen the bonds of friendship and belonging. To this end, we encourage you all to participate in social outing and fellowship gatherings during the year. Uh, the next member social is Wednesday at the Museum of History and Industry on Lake Union, and I do hope everybody shows for this. There's no cost, to it, but it'll be a great time to view the museum. Um, and since I'm a board member, I sort of like to push that too. It's a great place to be. Yeah, that's exactly right, Admiral. Um, it, yes, it was also my dad's old office too, because it was the Naval Reserve Training Center for many years. We even used to have a submarine docked in front of the uh, building. I remember that as a kid. So uh, going back to talking a little bit more about our future vision, if you have ideas or would like to host a get together of fellow Seattle Rotarians, please contact either Susie Rowe or Nicole Klein, who are implementing our future vision tilt toward greater membership engagement and connection. And I did see Susie here. I don't know, if, and Nicole too, they're waving their hands as Jan is. Um, as you all know, the future uh, vision implementation team is hard at work. Thank you much, Jan. Um, to implement and uh, provide other elements for our future vision plan. Your input and constructive suggestions are encouraged, so please email them to, and instead of emailing me or Jan or anybody else, do it toward feedback at seattlerotary.org. And that way, they will be cons the, your ideas and concerns will be considered by the implementation team and I won't have to forward it to anybody. So thank you very much. And now, without further ado, we have um, we have some music, and the music by Don Murphy and Freeman Fong. Do you want to come on over, Don? Now we can get up, guys. It's always better to be up and singing because good for the diaphragm. You're too far back. Get closer. All right. Well, as long as we don't Wait. disconnect. We don't disconnect yeah. at all. Plus, I can't, I can't see the third verse here. Oh, there, uh, yeah. it's right there. It's I didn't, right. Yeah, that see, you could have read that. I there. could have read it over here. That's right. <laughs> there, there's. It's right. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Johnny. <laughs> I can do it this way too. America the beautiful. It's uh, time to to think back. I think we do have a wonderful country. Pre oh, beautiful for spacious. And the ways of peace, all the prudence's matters, all the thoughts in play, all of America, America, watch and use peace on thee. 
All right, everybody, you can sit down again. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you very much, Freeman. We sure appreciate that. I want to thank uh, Dan Mead Smith for meeting and for the meeting reporting today, uh, which will be coming out at our bulletin. And um, uh, also uh, uh, David Bobanek and Jorge Chapa and Dave Gibbon for greeting and welcoming our guests as we can see on the board and uh, that which is really good. Isn't this neat? You know, this is the way we're going to do it so that I don't mispronounce anybody's name. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take applause at any point in time here. Um, and keeping ourselves on a semi-schedule here, I want to um, introduce John Steckler. You can get up here, you know. And this is really exciting because we have a, a very special spotlight and a great person to provide that. Oh, uh, he couldn't be here, so I'm here to provide it, okay? <laughs> uh, how y'all doing today? Boy, let me see. I got to make sure we got a new clicker. There we go. We're set. Well, um, fellow Rotarians and honored guests. Okay, this this month I've said it before, but this month's spotlight I gotta say it again. He he has a life that reads like a really good book. You know, each chapter is unique and and a special phase of that individual's life. Uh, so I'm gonna call today's spotlight the book of Bill because our spotlight member of the month is Bill Center. Yay! So let's get started with the book of Bill, chapter one just a Midwest kind of boy. Bill Center was born in Dayton, Ohio, the home of the Wright brothers, December 18th, 1945. He was born just two weeks prior to the year of the baby boomers, 1946. So I guess you could say Bill was kind of like a, an advanced scout for the rest of us, checking everything out uh, and uh, everything that was yet to, to, yet to come. His father, Jack, was trained as a concert pianist, and when he joined the Army in World War II, he became a chaplain's assistant. He met his wife and Bill's mother, Helen, while he was playing the piano in church. It was love at first sight. They were both wed, albeit at a very young age. Uh, Bill's mother, Helen, was trained as a microbiologist and worked at a local hospital. In fact, Bill Center's mother, Helen, was on the team that helped to create the flu vaccine. It's pretty impressive. There they are. Bill had three siblings growing up, two sisters, Mary and Margie, and a younger brother named David. Bill was called Billy until he was six years old, and then he told everybody, you better start calling me Bill from now on. Now, he had a great life growing up, exemplified by the fact that even though they were very, very poor, they never knew it. They just, they never knew it because they were so happy. In 1955, Bill's dad decided it was time to move to California. And with that, they took two weeks and two station wagons <laughs> and camped their way across the country when he was 10 years old. And they finally settled in the San Fernando Valley. All right. It's a, it was a very wild place back then, you know, not with gangs or anything, but more like, uh, I don't know, snakes, rabbits, coyotes, that kind of thing. So anyway, chapter two, the formative years. I gotta work on this. They changed my order here. Shortly after moving to California, Bill joined the junior choir at 12 years of age. And he met a young girl by the name of Carla who caught his attention. Uh, Bill and Carla continued to become friends as they went to school together and enjoyed those church camp retreats. And 
blithely unaware of what the future held. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Carla in a minute. And let's see. In high school, Bill was known for his love of music and athletics. Uh, here he is. This is a good one. Here he is part of a, a, a group called the Gentlemen of Jazz. The, the man on the far right, that was Bill's best man at his wedding. The drummer and trumpet player were both groomsmen. And Bill, he's that tall, skitty guy playing the clarinet in the center. Bill's other passion was athletics. He was a track star in high school and completed and finished third in the Los Angeles citywide track competition. He was also president of his high school letterman's club. Okay. But now we're going to go to chapter three, the college years. <laughs> Bill graduated from high school in 1963 at the age of 17. He went directly into the Navy ROTC program at UCLA, where he also played in the band. Now, Bill had mixed results in his college life. Some good, some not so good. So for example, in band, he got an A. In Navy science, he got an A. And everything else, he pretty much got Fs. Bill's a smart guy. He decided maybe UCLA wasn't right for him. So after one year, he applied and was accepted at the Navy Academy. That move saved Bill from flunking out. Unfortunately, at the Naval Academy, you're not allowed to be married. So Bill, although engaged, and here's a shot of him at his engagement party. And this is Carla in the center. And Carla, his future wife and current wife, is here today to join us in honoring Bill. Carla, welcome. Thank you for being here. I was, I was telling Carla before we got started, this is the only picture Bill sent me that kind of creeped me out. Because you could take Carla out of the center of this picture, you know, move her into a current picture, no problem. She's gorgeous, dressed nice. The rest of them, oh my God, they're stuck in a time warp. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Look at that. You could yeah, the, the wives look alike, even the men look alike, even Bill looks like his father and father-in-law. I mean, they all dress alike. It was That was an era back then. Thank God I didn't have to grow up in that. Okay. So... There he is. Uh, he, so Carla and he had to wait until they finished. Uh, he finished the Naval Academy to be married, and that meant an 18-month-long engagement. Eh, no problem. Not when you're in love. The Navy Academy truly saved Bill's life. It turned him around. It gave him the discipline he needed to study and excel. Uh, Bill met many friends at the Academy, including one such friend, Charlie Bolden, who became NASA's chief astronaut and later the director of NASA. Now, here's a picture of Bill's graduation. Look at that guy. Look at that chin. Look at that jawline. Wow. He graduated with many honors and accolades. Uh, Bill's degree from the Academy was a Bachelor of Science in Engineering with majors in political science and economics. Ten days after graduation, they didn't waste any time. Bill and Carla were finally married in a beautiful sword ceremony that you see here. Now, let's move on to Chapter 4. I love this one. I call it Bill's Ships. And there they are, Bill's ships. Bill's tour of ships included all the ones you see here. His first ship was the Feckler. They say that right? Without messing it up, Feckler. Kind of like it was named after an uncle of mine, never mind. Where he was stationed as a midshipman. Exploit was the first ship he commanded, and he served as second in command on the destroyer Blandy. Now, also, it's interesting, give you a little temptation here, as it takes a while to turn the page. Uh, after a tour on Blandy, Bill decided to go to grad school at any school in the country he could choose. He chose the University of Washington. When in 1976, 18 months later, he graduated with a master's degree in public administration, focusing on national security policy. And after the UW, he returned to sea with a tour, and then also a tour in the Pentagon, which was followed by an assignment on the Mayor Meyer Cork as commanding officer. Now, back to the Pentagon for a minute, it's kind of a sad note, but uh, Bill's office at the Pentagon was one of the, uh, one of the, one of the offices struck when the plane crashed into the Pentagon, and Bill lost some very dear friends in that attack. He served as the, on the famous aircraft carrier of the Midway as a chief engineer for three years, and he and the family moved, uh, served three tours in Japan, tough duty, and uh, while serving aboard Midway, he was promoted to captain. And from Midway, he went to his dream job, command of a guided missile cruiser the USS Reeves. Now, Bill said Reeves was his favorite ship at Midway was a close second. He also was stationed in Hawaii for two years. Now, his time in Hawaii was probably one of the most enjoyable for Carla and their young sons. He ran several marathons. Look at that skinny little guy running. Isn't he something? Look at the muscles on his arms. And he even qualified for the Boston Marathon. After Reeves, Bill went on to the Pentagon and he served as the director of strike warfare during Desert Storm. Yeah, I think this guy is, he, he was with us serving in Vietnam, uh, uh, Desert Storm, Afghanistan. I mean, he went from one difficult tour to another. He captured all the Navy's lessons learned from Desert Storm 
And he wrote it in a book. The book was heralded by the Navy and also some guy named I think Colin Powell thought it was pretty cool. And he wanted to meet the guy who so accurately captured this critical data. And in 1993, check out those shoulders. See those gold plates up there? Bill was promoted to Admiral. His first assignment was on the joint staff working for General Powell. After time in Washington, D.C., Bill was sent to San Francisco, here he is, for one year to oversee the closure of the naval facilities in the Bay Area because Bill and the family then moved to Seattle in 1996 to take over all the naval activities in the Pacific Northwest. He held this position from 96 to 99. His job was to create a unified naval solution to protect and perform the Pacific Northwest sector of the United States. <laughs> Seems hard to believe, but uh, with all this travel and relocation, Bill and Carla somehow found a way to bring two wonderful sons into the world. Their oldest, David, was born in 1971. Another one, Stephen, was born in 1974. I think the boys are going to be watching us on Zoom today, so boys, wish you could be here, but uh, your dad's an awesome guy. Now, here they are. This is them in 1982. So we're going to move on to Chapter 5. This is an interesting time in life for a lot of us. Reinvention into retirement. In 1999, Bill made the decision to move into retirement. He had joined Rotary in 96. Here he is. This is him, shown as his a role as Sergeant of Arms. He was also president of the Washington State Council on International Trade for seven years. And he became our club president for the 2006-2007 year. Now, Bill always enjoyed his time in Rotary, especially with the friends he made along the way. Here he is with his friend Herb Bridge. It was Herb that sponsored Bill into Rotary. And they, they had a long and, and, and close friendship. And in 2012, Bill supported his friend Herb when he was awarded the first University of Washington Distinguished Alumni Veteran Award in 2012, an award that Bill himself would receive in 2020. From 1999 to 2017, Bill was a guest lecturer at the University of Washington, Seattle Pacific University, the Evans School of uh, Public uh, uh, Policy and Governance. And in fact, in 2015, he received the Evans School of Distinguished Public Service Award with his good friend, Dan Evans. It was also during this time that Bill created something called Grampy, Grampy Day Camp. Grampy Day Camp. This is an opportunity for Bill to spend as much quality time with his two twin granddaughters as he could. Now, Grampy Day Camp focused on teaching his granddaughters, oh, things like a love of cooking, maybe the music, the arts, and of course, quality time and quality ice cream. He also taught them about discipline. Um, let me turn the page while you reflect on that picture. Oh, and a chance to meet some of Grampy's famous friends. They also got to dress up in Grampy's old dress uniform. Now, this is his granddaughter. This has not been altered. That was the size of Bill's waist in the Navy. Wow, that's discipline. <laughs> yeah, that was really bad food, yeah. <laughs> okay, well... Grampy Day Camp was a big part of the granddaughter's lives, and it prepared them for all of the challenges and opportunities leading up to when they went away for college. It was a great service to his grandchildren. Service to his grandchildren, service to his country. Let's go on to chapter six. It's a tough chapter for all of us. Some of us haven't caught it yet. Some have been through it. Some are living it. Uh, in 2017, Bill suffered a stroke. That, along with bad arthritis and a chronic autoimmune, led him to a seven and a half year long battle with recovery and some decline. For a man of a purposeful driven life, those years were long. His days were challenging and fighting off depression. But with the support of his family, fight it he did. Bill gets up every morning. He knows he has the power of choice. He could choose to make it a positive day or a negative day. And Bill Center, <laughs> He's a very positive person. You know, the Navy taught Bill to embrace camaraderie, embrace others. And one of his famous rules for life is you can never have too many friends. So fellow Rotarians, before we embrace our newest Rotary Spotlight member of the month, I'd like to play a little short video that tells you just how Bill Center embraces the people he meets.
got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. When the roads are rough ahead, miles and miles in your nice warm bed, you just remember what your old pal said. Yeah, you've got a friend in me. Oh boy, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got trouble. I got them too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together, we see it through, cause you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Some of the folks might be a little bit smarter than we are, bigger and stronger too. Maybe, but none of them will ever love you the way I do. It's me and you, boy. And that never is go by. Our friendship will never die. You're gonna see it's our destiny. You got a friend in me. Uh -huh. You got a friend in me. Oh, yeah. You got a friend in me. <laughs> Thanks, Fellow Rotarians, our Rotary Spotlight Member of the Month and our friend, Mr. Bill Center. Absolutely spectacular. Thank you, John. Congratulations, Admiral. And I will always be Admiral. You know, that's something that my dad always said. He was always Admiral, so is Bill. And uh, I'm going to now um, uh, introduce Pete Delaney, who normally does all of our bulletins, but he's not this time. What he's going to be doing is introducing our speaker. All right. How many, how many Seattle Times subscribers here in the audience? All right. Good, good, good. The 2024 election uh, will be pivotal for the United States and for the state of Washington. Today, we welcome Seattle Times editorial page editor Kate Riley to the podium to talk about current election issues, the Seattle Times endorsement process, and how divided our state is. The 2024 election is important from the far-reaching impact of the presidential decision on state uh, on Washington state to make decisions on a uh, new governor, attorney general, lands commissioner, and challenges to one-party control in Olympia with initiatives on the ballot that would undo climate, long-term care, and tax policies. Kate is a seasoned journalist who worked as a reporter and editor in Eastern Washington newspapers for 17 years uh, before being recruited to the Seattle Times editorial page in 2002. Kate is a graduate of Redmond High School and the University of Washington. She's a former Kennewick Columbia Center Rotarian, and we hope to recruit her into Seattle 4. Join me in welcoming Kate Riley. <laughs> Very good. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so I was telling my colleague, Melissa Davis, who's the deputy opinion editor, say hi, Melissa. She's the one who wrangles guest columns. So for us, um, I was telling her that I was kind of nervous to be speaking to a Rotary Club because I used to be a Rotarian, um, but I'm really happy to be here. And thank you, everyone who, said, who subscribes to the Seattle Times. I really think it makes a difference. Um, so about Rotary, I have very fond memories. Um, I've been in mind of Rotary this week with the news stories out of Gaza about the pause and violence and um, polio for polio vaccinations. I sold a lot of those yellow ducks <laughs> for that effort. Do you guys sell ducks? <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, um, it was interesting, the mention of 9-11. Uh, I was the program chair for Columbia Center Rotary that week. It was, you know, early September. 
and uh, our our pro our speaker had to cancel. And so I'm going, what are we going to do? And it was interesting. I went on C um, Rotary International website, and I was just so moved by the outpouring of messages from Rotary clubs around the world, Africa, Europe, Asia, you know, expressing solidarity with the United States and sympathy. And so what I did for the program is I printed out 12 um, of the, the statements, the messages, and gave them to each of our 12 tables. And so each each table read that. And uh, there was not, I'm getting choky right now, there's not a dry eye in the house, but just to rest in the international community of Rotary, which is really cool. Um, okay, so this was very uplifting. Bill, I love, Admiral, I really loved your, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I guess I'm kind of um, feeling a little guilty that my message maybe is not so, upbeat. Um, I think it is, um, in general, though, what I've seen. I've been at this game in opinion journalism since 1995 for the Tri-City Herald. I came to the Seattle Times in 2022. I was hired in part because of my Eastern Washington experience, and the Times, which also owns the Walla Walla paper and the Yakima paper, was looking for someone who could write about rural and urban tensions. And what I've noticed all over all those years is how Republicans have kind of disappeared from the Seattle area and Democrats have kind of disappeared from Eastern Washington. Tom Foley, the Speaker of the House, was from Spokane. When I lived in Kennewick, Jay Inslee was my Congress member um, before he moved west. Um, and I think that's really a shame that we don't have more diversity among our politicians. Um, which brings me to my favorite Mark Twain quote, um, and that is, to lodge all power in one party and keep it there is to ensure bad government and the sure and gradual deterioration of the public morals. Only Mark Twain could, <laughs> could say that. But my point isn't about, is, isn't about lamenting that we we're a democratic controlled state. I could be saying the same thing in Idaho, which as you know, is dominated by Republicans. And, um, you know, just a look at the Idaho legislature's positions on abortion and, and punishing people that provide abortions or take, take people out of the state for abortions. Uh, it really is a shame when we're not listening more to each other and trying to find common ground. Um, so um, <clears throat> my nightmare came true. I got out of order. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, well, you all know what has happened in the last 20 years. Um, swing, swing districts, legislative districts are almost non-existent in King County. Um, the Democrats have controlled the governor's mansion since 84, but increasingly the margins of control in the state house and Senate are diminishing greatly in favor of the Democrats. After November 5th, it's likely that all 10 of the state's partisan constitutional offices will be held by Democrats. Um, what I see, and we, I don't know, Melissa, we interview more than a hundred candidates every year for, um, um, endorsements. Uh, what we see are the races tend, be, tend to be not between Republicans and Democrats, but around here, it's between the left and the lefter. We saw that four years ago when a Democratic union representative, with the support of Governor Jay Inslee, ran against a moderate Democrat in the 5th Legislative District, sort of the Issaquah area. Senator M Mark Mullet of Issaquah, um, who was a leader in his caucus, won by just dozens of votes. And recently, this year, he lost his bid uh, to run for governor. He was eliminated in the primary. His moderation in the Senate caucus will be missed, but he follows other moderate Democrats who have left Olympia, including former first district Senator Guy Palumbo. Um, he's from Maltby, and former 45th, 4th district Senator Steve Hobbs who's from Lake Stevens, and he is now the Washington Secretary of State, but he's not in the Senate. <laughs> they call them 
the moderate Democrats, they call themselves roadkill Democrats, but there's very really few of them left. Um, so in the state house this year, I'm watching the challenge of Democratic Representative Larry Springer in the 44, 45th district. So he's from Kirkland. Um, he's challenged by a fellow Democrat who identifies herself as an, a community organizer and a union representative. Um, Springer, who's a former Kirkland mayor and business owner, is a caucus leader and often reaches across the aisle and the state for solutions. His opponent is aligned with the dominant uh, far left in our state. Um, she wants to provide unemployment benefits to workers who choose to go on strike. Um, the Edit Times editorial board um, opposes this idea. Um, a trend we are seeing, especially among Democratic candidates, is fewer and fewer have served their communities in the trenches. And we always look for a civic resume. Were you on the planning commission? Were you on the parks board? Did you run for school board? Did you serve on your school district's uh, levy finance committee? You know, that getting down into the infrastructure that is so important to making our communities work. Fewer and fewer of them are coming, are, are seeking higher office through that, um, that means. Um, so rather what we're seeing are organizers and activists recruited to press the agenda of powerful groups such as unions, um, big business on the other side. No question this happens on both sides of the aisle. Um, and we've also seen, you know, mega aligned groups supporting the far right, but you have to go a little bit further out of Seattle for that. Um, the, why does this matter? Um, going back to Mark Twain's quote, it, if, you, if you're only talking to your friends, if you're only, um, you know, uh, supporting your friends and not talking to others that disagree with you, that's not, that's not gonna serve the people, all of the people. So, um, while, um, so government oversight is an issue. While inquiries into federal branch elections have been weaponized in Congress, many such inquiries are very useful to the balance of power, ensuring the people are served. A few years ago, the State Department of Corrections was found to be releasing incarcerated people before they were supposed to. Um, in a couple of cases, uh, they committed murders. At the time, Republicans were in charge of the state Senate and they conducted hearings that held the corrections department to account. Fast forward to today, we have a couple of really concerning issues. One, if you look in the Seattle Times today, there's a really interesting story about a slow rolling debacle with the state's pr youth prison system. Um, it's very complicated. Um, it's a long story, so I'll refer you to that. But where is the scrutiny over the disappointing failure of the Department of Children, Youth, and Families to allow overcrowding at Green Hill, a youth prisons? What was supposed to be law changes that were more focused on rehabilitation for these young people has overwhelmed the system. And some of these young people spend 22 hours a day in their cells. Uh, what about our ferry system? I don't know if anybody came here by ferry today, anybody? <laughs> um, that has been a 12 year crisis in the making. Um, where is the hearing to name names and point figures, where's the state performance audit on how what led us to this point? Um, the editorial board met this week to discuss that topic and other issues with tra State Transportation Secretary Roger Millar. His agency is doing what it can to improve the system, getting rid of some of the rules that prevent um, people from starting work full-time as workers for the ferry system before you had to go through a lot of different hoops to get hired permanently. Um, but Millar, interestingly, traced the ferry system's troubles back to the specter of Initiative 695. Remember that? Tim Iman and his $30 car tabs campaign? In 1999, 56% of Washington voters voted to repeal existing fees and excise taxes for motor vehicles and imposed a, a flat annual $30 license tap fee. 
So that brings me to the second concern I have about a system that doesn't have reliable checks on itself. Um, people, voters get upset sometimes. Um, when members of the party in charge mostly meet with its funders or each other, rather than with constituents who are underrepresented by special interests, they are at risk of overreaching. Lawmakers are at risk of overreaching. Just like in 1999, when the legislature did not respond to calls for reform of the state's exorbitant motor vehicle excise tax, the people provided a check on that inaction. So this year, Brian Haywood, you've probably heard about him. He's the new Tim Iman, a wealthy man who didn't like what he saw as the legislature's overreach, put millions of dollars to finance signature gathering efforts to send six initiatives to the legislature. Lawmakers put three up to a vote within the legislature and just adopted them into law. Uh, one was restoring the police pursuit law, which you probably saw was very controversial the last couple of five minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, which was very controversial the last couple of years. Um, uh, also banning the income tax. That was probably smart of the legislature because that's been turned down three times at the Washington on the Washington ballot. And then one having to do with parental rights. Um, so... Okay, but, this, but the legislature lets stand three others that will have repercussions on the state's climate response and the state budget. One is Initiative 2117, and that would repeal the state's Climate Commitment Act. Last Sunday, the Seattle Times editorial board urged voters not to repeal the law. We feel it is necessary start for a state to address climate issues, um, but it's controversy, controversial. And again, back to... <laughs> Uh, gas taxes, um, the pro side is suggesting that, um, you know, you will, voters will save money on their gases, gas prices. So um, anyway, uh, another one is initiative 2124, which would allow residents to opt out of the now mandatory long-term Washington care, Washington cares, long-term care insurance. And the other is initiative 2109 which would cancel the 7% capital gains tax that is applied to very, very high earners. Um, so, so obviously that, you know, pe that is being promoted as, this is a, a camel's nose in the tent of the income tax um, to voters. So my concern is that voters will not educate themselves about all of these issues and will believe in the rhetoric that they hear that floods their mailboxes that that floods their television programs with on during the commercials um and that's my concern but the legislature honestly has can only blame itself to put put um to bring us to this point um so now like i said i was feeling guilty because i was so cheered up by the start of this program. Um, but what is the remedy to all this? Obviously it's it's voter engagement. It's looking carefully at who is running to represent you in the legislature in Congress and other positions. At the Times editorial board, we, um, we look for several things. Uh, one is somebody who has a public servant's heart who, when you ask what motivates them, they talk about uh, the kids at the high school that they volunteered with, or they talk about um, the senior center down the road and how they help to build ramps or something. Um, the spine of an independent. Yeah, somebody who can say no to their friends. And, um, and then just an authenticity, an authenticity that goes with serving people. Um, I'm not saying that the folks that are running for office or the trend that I've seen, um, that these are bad people. Absolutely not. They believe in what they believe in. Um, but I think we need to get back to finding leaders that serve the people. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. And um, if we have any questions here, okay. Here we go. David. 
Thank you. Um, I was wondering, as being a Western Washingtonian, can you help us understand the Eastern Washingtonian's mindset? <laughs> well, yeah, I lived, so I went to high school and college over here, but I lived over in Eastern Washington for a long time. My first job was as a farm reporter, loved that. I was an economics major at UW, so I loved, loved that. Um, and at first I was thinking that the change, that the shift towards more Republicans was that the Democrats didn't do a good enough job of representing the concerns and interests of natural resource economies, like agriculture, like mining, like logging. Um, I, I know that there is a frustration uh, in Eastern Washington of not feeling like they have a say in state government. For instance, a couple years ago, there was a um, the transportation chairs in the House and the Senate. They left the Republicans out of a of a bill, a transportation package. And if you talk to former um, House Majority Leader or Minority Leader, um, he would tell you that there were a lot of rural roads that were not funded because of that. So, um, the interesting thing, and this is a positive. So um, two years ago, Representative Dan Newhouse, remember he was one of our two Washington representatives that voted to impeach Donald Trump. He did not lose his job, which was great. Um, when he was uh, challenged by Clint Didier, um, he was challenged again by two uh, Republicans. He got through, he was second highest vote getter. And now, because of our top two system, you'll have moderates voting in that election. I suspect he will he will be reelected. And that's a guy, farmer, hops grower. If you hoist an IPA, you've probably had some of his hops. Um, he was the Secretary of Agriculture. He's a Republican under Democrat Christine Gregoire. So he works across the aisle. Uh, thanks for being here today. The Seattle Times is a local treasure. My father worked there all his life. Uh, how is the times evolving to be more relevant to uh, newer, younger generations? Because there's plenty of subscribers here, yeah, but uh, people under the age of 30, uh, I'd love to see or hear more about the Times' strategy to try and evolve into the future, especially now with the Blevin family moving on. Yeah, um, well, the Blevin family will not be moving on because um, we have a fifth generation uh deputy or associate publisher, Ryan Blethen. He works in the newsroom. And this summer we had Grace Blethen, who's a member of the sixth generation intern throughout the newsroom. So, and she's a rising senior. So, um, so what we're trying to do, and Melissa, you may have some things to add about this, but um, she's our former features editor and page one editor. But what we're trying to do is be as current as possible to cover things that people care about, but also serve up some veggies, right? Like, oh, City Light is going to raise your rates. You need to pay attention to that. But also we have a really uh, great selection of uh, features, entertainment news. What's What can you do? What are the hikes if you've, if you've seen it? Do you have anything else to add, Melissa? <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Right. So I have a question. Uh, I'm Did you hear that? <laughs> I used my admiral voice. <laughs> Here you go, so, Amy. <laughs> anyway, yeah. If we don't subscribe to the Times, it's going to go away. 
Okay. Okay. Well, and I would just also add that um, the leadership at the Seattle Times, including the publisher, Frank Blethen, and our president and CEO, uh, Alan Fisco, as well as the rest of the leadership team, have worked really hard on diversifying the revenues that we have. For instance, you've probably noticed we have a project homeless. We have an education lab. We have a traffic lab. We have an investigative fund. And so some of that is kind of, I always compare it to the public TV model where we have have people who contribute um, to these funds. They don't interact with our reporters. They interact with editors, but we're able to hire more people because of that generosity of our community. I have a quick question for you. Yes. Uh, and that is you talked about these initiatives. Is the Times going to take a position on each of these initiatives? Yes. Uh, we took an, a, a position on 2117, the Climate Commitment Act. We're saying please keep the uh, the Climate Commitment Act. I always get the math wrong because it's a repeal, so you have to vote no to repeal it, but keep it. Um, the other two, we are conducting interviews within the next week. Um, the one on the WACARES long-term care insurance and the capital gains tax, we're doing side-by-side -side, um, interviews next week, and TVW will be recording those, so those will be available on TVW. And we'll provide the links to that in our on our pages. So after that, we'll decide. Uh, yes, thank you for being here uh, today. Um, one of my observations is that in Washington State, we have a part time legislature. So I believe you know one year it's two months, and the next year it's three months, and it may go even longer, you know, depending on on the clock and and how much work gets done. Uh, so it's hard to I would think to get someone to run for public office. Because can you leave your job for a two-month period and then get back to it? And how can your employer afford to have you gone for that two-month period and deal with that or a three-month period or for the inconsistency that may happen along the way? And so getting quality people to raise their hand and say, yes, I'll run regardless of party is, uh, is difficult in our state. Uh, what's your observation of that? Um, I, I see what you mean exactly. I feel like that would be a lot more mischief <laughs> if it was a full-time legislature. I mean, I know that the idea though of a citizen of, of a part-time legislature is a citizen legislature. So, you know, you go back to your district, you, you go to the state fair, press the flesh, you show up at your school board meetings, you talk to the rotary club, you know, that's, that's the idea of it. And um, I'm not sure. Well, it costs a lot more money too, by the way. So, yeah. Um, the the other thing I'd like to just real quickly make a point about, and I can't believe I forgot, but um, the other concern that we have, especially as in many newspapers, the Seattle Times is good going concern still, thanks to our leadership, but many newspapers have shrunk or disappeared. Um, 20 years ago, King County reporter would be asking questions, the PI would be asking questions, the Times would. And especially because of that, the Public Records Act and the Public Meetings Act has never been more important. So when you don't have reporters find, you know, reporting on stories, individuals need to be able to have that access. And one thing that we're very concerned about with the state legislature, particularly emanating out of the House, of representatives is their efforts to invoke something called legislative privilege to hide their documents, their emails. And we're in court right now with, with them about that. Did you? Mine isn't a question. I Two comments, one that you touched on that I'm very impressed with your special labs mm -hmm. um, because they can dig in on the homeless or traffic or whatever issue. And I really appreciate that. And the other thing I appreciate is when there's not a good candidate running, you say so. <laughs> and recently you said in one particularly legislative race, none of the above. Yeah. And I, that's a very, we did that today. We did that today, but we're trying, we try to be candid about our reasons for each. So still the reader can say, I'm okay with that. So I'm, you know, so I'll vote for that person. I mean, there's still hopefully some information readers can use. So thank you.
we do we do want to invite you to be a member of our Rotary Club. And, and um, we will be sending you a link to do that. But in addition to that, we want to, in on behalf of our um, Seattle Service uh, uh, Foundation, we are presenting you with 600 meals uh, to uh, First Harvest. And here they are. Thank you. Thank you. Now. Did you, did you hear me sing those? Yeah. We'll let you sing any time, Kate, uh, particularly if you join the Rotary Club. I would certainly appreciate all of that. That is really great. Um, at this particular point, I want to thank you again, uh, Kate, and also thank um, um, RB, REB Enterprises and Carl Benke, and also uh, who is our gold sponsor, and also to um, to thank Bloodworks Northwest for sponsorship of the meetings. Um, and I would like to invite Paul Sai forward for a second, and then we've got a bunch of other little things that we're going to cover right after that. So fast, Paul. <laughs> we're, both, we're both, Paul. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paul Spudner to talk about uh, visiting Kobe Rotary Club. I, hopefully many of you are getting to know uh, my face a little bit. I've been in this Rotary Club since early this year, March, and I'm happy to be here. As you probably heard at earlier meetings, our sister club in Kobe, Japan, is celebrating their 100th anniversary as a Rotary Club. And they have sent an invitation for us to send folks to represent Seattle 4 at their 100th anniversary celebration. Uh, Paul and I both have had the benefit of living in Japan at various points in our life, and so we're volunteering to lead that group. And what we're interested in today is finding out who else might be interested in going. Yes, um, the dates um, of the meeting for Kobe is Thursday, November 16th, and there's a second event going on at the Kobe, or excuse me, at the Tokyo Rotary Club that Paul Tsai was once a member of that's taking place the previous Saturday. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, I'm sorry, I said November 16th, November 21st for Kobe, November 16th is the date of the Tokyo event. He and I are planning on going to both. And th that means we'll probably be leaving Seattle to go to Japan on November 14th and staying through the 23rd. It's about a nine day trip. If you didn't want to go for the whole nine days and just wanted to go for the Kobe portion, uh, we could help arrange that as well. And um, I, I think, you know, it's probably going to be helpful to, for you to know that you're probably going to have to invest maybe four or five thousand dollars by the time you buy plane ticket, spend money on hotels, food, your transportation around Japan and things like that. But we would be happy for as many people as possible to join us. So after this meeting, Paul and I will be hanging out at that table that's closest to the door. Please come up, give us your name and some contact information, and we'll start to organize things and take it from there. Yes, the dates for the Kobe meeting, it's Thursday, November 21st. And the Tokyo event is Saturday, November 16th. And when you leave Japan, or excuse me, when you leave Seattle to go to Japan, you lose a day. So we would go on the 14th, arrive on the 15th, so that we were there on the 16th for that next meeting. Thank you very much. And of course, on the way home, you gain a whole day. That's so. <laughs> now, the other thing is, is we'll put some information in the bulletin uh, to make sure that that those that aren't here to meet in the back of the room that might be interested in going uh, will have that information. Um, at this particular point, I just want to um, mention for uh, for you to uh, our future district governor, um, Jeff Boric, it wanted to take a quick poll of everybody. Um, it will take about 10 seconds, right? You just used eight of my 10. Um, quickly, hi, I'm your uh, past president and will be district governor in 25 and 26. Quick show of hands. How many went to the district conference up in Victoria a little over a year ago? Or how many have been to a district conference in the past? 
it's typically a great get together, uh, but there's not going to be a district conference this cycle. So I'm investigating a district conference spring of 26, April 26, and just wanted a quick show of hands that locations likely to be Walla Walla, Washington. How many would be interested in going to have some wine and maybe wine a little in Walla Walla? Thank you so much. Now, Walla Walla is really great. You know, we're not going to the penitentiary. We're doing other things, you know. <laughs> it's it's the wine, you know. It was founded, basically, you know, it really got its go because of the penitentiary. You know, that was, Olympia got the capital. Walla Walla got the penitentiary. Yes. Yeah, well, all right. Yes, agriculture started. No, there was the Whitmans started it. So anyway, forget that. There was also the the third thing was Seattle got the university and we got the right thing here. It was it provided us with much more economic benefit. All right. Given all of that, um, I should probably point out um, a little bit about TRF. Um, Jim provided me with this. From from Rotary International on on malaria, right? Our malaria project. Uh, it's a little big for me. It's the extra large, and I think both Bobby and I can fit into it together. But auction anybody who wants this that's big enough to fit into it will be glad if you if you if you pledge to TRF, you can have it. I'm going to give it to Mary, and she can figure that out. All right. Now, before we leave all of this, I just want to tell you a little bit about what happened on September 4th, you know, just to give you a little bit of background. We're going back to 1781, where the city of Los Angeles was founded as El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora La Reina de Los Angeles. Now, that's my Spanish accent. The village of Our Lady of the Queen of the Angels. That was in 1781. In 1870, Emperor Napoleon III of France was deposed and the Third Republic was declared. In 1970, Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. In 1998, Google was founded by Larry Page and Sergey Brin, um, two Stan uh, Stanford University students. And in the year 2001, Boeing moved its headquarters to Chicago. Well, we expected to come back to Seattle because they didn't stay long in Chicago. They moved to Arlington, Virginia. You know, what happened? Phil Condit really screwed this up. No offense, you guys. He was a nice guy, but and he is. But he really screwed it all up. And that's where we are today. Now, more importantly, birthdays. Birthdays, uh, 1981, Beyonce. This is her birthday. And... And most importantly for today is Newspaper Carrier Day. And that's perfect for Kate. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>